next meeting of the Education and Skills Service Transformation Committee of the 23rd of October 2024. Uh, so I'll dive straight into the agenda and ask if we have any apologies for absence. None of your chat. Lovely. So none received as we stand. Uh, the second item on the agenda is the disclosure of personal and prejudicial interest. Oh, sorry, Bev, because I've got a hand up, Bev. Uh, sorry, uh, can I give my White's apologies, please? Thank you, Bev. Uh, disclosures of personal and prejudicial interest, are there any? No. Uh, we move on to the minutes for the last meeting. And uh, we've got to go through these to approve uh, approve them and sign them as a correct record. Can we go through page one at a time? Page one, page two, page three, and page four. Are we content for me to sign them as a true record of the meeting? Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Linda. And thanks, Bev. OK, so we're moving swiftly on to item number four. And I can hand over to Kate Phillips, who's in the room with us, for her focus on supporting positive behaviour in schools. Kate's prepared a, a presentation for us. Kate. Thank you. Um, I'll just share the presentation with you one moment. I'll put it on the board. OK, apologies. Thank you. I've got the presentation there now. So um, the purpose uh, this afternoon is really uh, to give you an update on the work that we've been doing in relation to um, behaviour in schools. So if I give you um, an update on progress to date, first of all, then I'll share a bit more detail around the specifics of the work that we've been doing. So um, since uh, we last met, we've held two multi-agency workshops and those workshops have provided really detailed feedback in relation to five key questions. We've collated uh, that feedback and we've themed it. Um, and we've also circulated a questionnaire to schools. That questionnaire is uh, still live and will remain live until um, uh, the end of the half term, which is Friday. Um, and we've done some early analysis on the questionnaire results. But as I say, we've still got a uh, two further days to run um, so we'll incorporate any further uh, feedback into that analysis. So the workshops and the questionnaires focused on five key questions and um, I think I shared these at the last uh, committee meeting because we were able to give some early feedback on the emerging themes um, but just by way of a reminder uh, we asked around the questions, the issues um, that schools and indeed wider organisations are dealing with in regards to the behaviour of children and young people within their organisations. We asked what approaches we felt were needed to support children and young people to manage their behaviour. We asked what organisations wanted to see um, happen uh, in order to manage difficult behaviour amongst children and young people. And we asked what uh, they were able to offer either individually or as a, as a collective organisation in order to support behaviour for schools in Swansea. And we asked how we could work collectively. So in terms of um, the contributors, we had um, over 120 um, people attend face to face meetings. Primarily, they were representatives from schools, but also um, officers from central services, uh, from the wider um, council, from Channel Family Services, our health board. Um, we had uh, Welsh Government officials who attended, Public Health Wales, um, and trade union representatives, school counselling services. I know some, some of this committee attended as well. So a really broad uh, representation, which we were really pleased about because it gave us that kind of um, real collective insight. Um, in terms of the feedback, um, probably helpful to share 
the detail in um, a bit more um, in a bit more detail around what that feedback was. So, in terms of the issues, we gave um, some emerging themes in the last committee meeting, but we've been able to build upon that now um, and take the, the further information from the additional workshops and the um, early input from the questionnaires. And what we're seeing really is the main issues are around a dysregulation and emotional response. So that can be increasingly um, a physical response from children and young people. Um, and we also understand from the feedback that there's a gap between the home and school expectations. Um, there's insufficient resource within the local authority to support schools in the way that they would like to see happen. Um, and that they're reporting um, a higher number of children with complex needs and with additional learning needs. I've put complex in inverted commas there. There's, there's a kind of formal definition for what would constitute a child with, with complex needs. Um, but what our colleagues in, in schools are reporting is that they feel that the, the needs are more generally complex than, than they are uh, used to dealing with. And there are also themes around issues of, of respect, respect for authority and so on. Um, so in terms of what approaches are needed, and this, the, the, it's important, I think, to note that this language, that this um, uh, feedback is direct from um, participants. So this is not um, our representation of it. This is what's going to be Yeah, yeah, direct, fine. That's good. Direct good. From, yeah, we don't have all of you to account yeah, for what it. everyone else has said. Thank you. <laughs> and I, think it's I think it's really important because it gives a flavour for the kind of, you know, the, the, the feel um, of, of, the, of what's happening at the moment. So... In terms of what approaches are needed, um, early intervention and support, training and development, parental involvement and support. There's an ask around consistent policies and procedures and positive reinforcement and relationships. So um, funding and resources is identified, specialist support and training, parental and community engagement, support from external um, agencies and consistent and clear guidelines. So you can see that kind of theme emerging around, you know, a, a need for a breadth of different types of support mechanisms, but also achieving consistency. When we asked um, what uh, individuals and individual organisations could offer, um, we had comments around direct support and intervention, so that very kind of immediate response. Uh, an offer around specialist knowledge and training, so really coming from a position of experience, being able to, to share, share again best practice and ideas and a willingness to collaborate, to communicate, to make sure that that expertise is maximised. Um, we asked about how we can work collectively um, and the themes really there are around collaboration and shared vision. So beginning to see some of the interdependencies when we talk about um, collaboration and communication as something that could be offered and then a collective approach is around collaboration and shared vision. Um, community and parental engagement, again, that theme's coming out very strongly in terms of something that's, that's, that's needed to be developed. Sharing resources and training, um, support from external agencies, and data sharing and evaluation um, is something that was considered really significant in terms of a, of a collected working. So um, when kind of, you know, considering all of this uh, in, in terms of how we take it forward, um, I thought it was kind of helpful to share this um, image in, in terms of what we really identified from the feedback. So um, you see at the, the tip of the iceberg, really, are the behaviours. That's what we're seeing. That's the very immediate thing that uh, the issues that schools are dealing with. So, you know, hitting rage, shouting, uh, uh, tears and so on. The kind of thing that, that you know, you would really associate with, with behaviour. But it's much more than that. So what we've understood from the feedback is that there's far more um, that's, that's um impacting on that uh, behaviour and creating that situation. So we look at, for example, some of the, um, in, if I put them in the ocean, the wider context then, um, things like family dynamics, uh, the impact of, of poverty, um, culture, social media pressures, societal pressures on children and young people, 
and the, sp the support that is or isn't available more broadly um, in the wider context. And then, you know, what we see then is for those young children and young people, what's sitting behind some of that behaviours uh, are perhaps anxiety, sensory overload, tiredness, hunger, distress, past traumas. So it's, it's the, the discomfort, the feeling of being perhaps rejected or threatened or even bored, um, which is manifesting itself in um, behaviours that are quite challenging so what we need to do next really is to do something uh, to address that so we have the feedback which has helpfully given us um some context around what uh, a professional think would be useful what we can build upon um one of the things that we um established early on in the workshops was that we needed um suggestions and we needed to develop something that was both aspirational but also achievable um, I think the achievable bit is really important in terms of our um, funding context. So I think it's really important um, to share that um, sometimes uh, we hear requests for, you know, additional resource, additional funding. We need something more to be able to do this. Um, we've got the image in the centre there of, of, you know, that's our purse, that's our pot. It's it's shared. We might all have access to a different credit card, but ultimately it's all coming out of the same bank account. So um, this is one pot of money um, that we need to use. We know there are pressures on schools. Um, when, when there are pressures on schools, we will hear them say that we need to refer that. And I've used, again, inverted commas because we've got a formal referral mechanism, but also schools kind of, you know, really seeking support, seeking um, additional resource from the local authority but our resources are limited um, to the pot to what we have um, it's shared between us and, and schools so that provides an additional pressure on the local authority there's then risk of additional costs in terms of potentially like independent places additional support that needs to be funded and it's a, a vicious circle is what we've got there because that then places those pressures on schools because the, the because the funding is limited so finding our way um to do something successful and effective within that context is really important we can't ignore it um or we have to be realistic about it um and you know we've got to work we've got to recognize it as a challenge and work within it so i think that's something that's going to be important in developing the work going forward and making sure that we do get something that is both aspirational but also achievable so that will um be guiding us really in the work that we do going forward um one of the other things that we think is really important to do is to agree a vision so when we collated the feedback um there was a real breadth in terms of the feedback it there were um extremes in terms of viewpoints um as you would expect in something that's kind of you know so um it's it's a very interesting engaging relevant and immediate topic for people because people are feeling the consequences of, of that um so I think it's really important in that when we've observed those ex extremes, we need to find a way to seek a collective agreement because it would be um, foolish, I think, to ignore uh, the extremes because people will be committed to those. So we need to find a way to share um, a vision um, and develop that together based on the feedback. So we so we have a collective agreement around uh, what we believe is our shared vision approach towards um, supporting positive behaviour in schools. So in terms of what we plan to do next, um, we need to uh, collate all of the findings. So as I say, the questionnaire is still open and we need to reshare that collated um, uh, response. So we've got, um, it's a draft form at the moment, we've got a report which details all of that feedback in relation to every question from every different kind of element of uh, agencies that have fed into that, and that's quite a detailed document at the moment. So we need to refine it um, and we need to reshare it with people who've taken part to make sure that we've got it right, that we've kind of you know um, assessed all the feedback correctly. Um, and the next stage from that will be to produce a draft policy, or I should say, in terms of collating those findings, we have got a meeting tomorrow, another workshop tomorrow with head teachers, where we hope to start to test some of our um, findings to make sure that we've got it right um, and that we've uh, accurately reflected the work. Um, and then we've got a further one planned for end of November um, and then a further workshop in January, which we hope to be producing a draft policy by that point. Um, so and that will be based on uh, that kind of temperature check, if you like, around the feedback. We think from some of the feedback 
um, that a toolkit is going to be really useful, some practical um, resources, signposting. Um, we don't want a one size fits all approach, but what we do want to do is have kind of quality assured access, signposting to resources, to tools, to strategies um, that schools uh, can use. Um, and we want to identify some best practice um, so that we're able to uh, share that. Um, we think that there's probably a gap in terms of some research um, that could be done to understand what happens elsewhere, what kind of academic research may have been undertaken, um, what could have been done by you know other agencies, um, particularly colleagues in third sector, um, and drawing on some existing expertise um, of uh, school colleagues where we know that there's a real strength there. Um, and so, again, how we bring those um, that expertise in to inform the, the process. And then, of course, we need a delivery plan. So, you know, we, we've got to uh, find a way to, to kind of transform um, a strategy, a policy into something that, that's recognisable and deliverable. Um, so that's kind of where we are. As I say, we've got uh, three follow up workshops planned. This is very much a kind of ongoing piece of work. So I'm sort of sharing with you, uh, you know, a, a moment in time in, in terms of where, where we are. Um, and um, obviously, you know, any input from the committee, absolutely welcome in, in terms of is that the right approach? Anything you would like to see us uh, do differently to shape some of that and uh, go from there. Thank you, Kate. Councillor Robert Smith. Robert? Yes, thank you, Jen. Can I thank Kate for giving us such a, a valuable overview of the work that that's ongoing? Um, we know that there are uh, significant issues with behaviour uh, across our schools. It's been um, attributed a lot of it to COVID, although I think there are other factors, other social factors and economic factors at play as well. Um, Welsh Government to their credit, have looked at a prioritised attendance. I think that behaviour needs to be looked at in conjunction with attendance. And if you look at the work that was done, and I keep referring to it some 20 years ago, when we had the National Behaviour and Attendance Review, the two issues were linked, and I think they need to be uh, need to continue to be, uh, to be linked. Um, the work we're doing here in Swansea, I think, working with the professionals, uh, trying to take people on board, learning the lessons of what's actually happening. And I think that's one of the important things about the work that Kate has been doing and the team have been doing is let's not hide this and pretend things aren't happening. Let's ask our teachers and, and, and others working in schools, well, what is the situation? Let's have a, a what's and all description because we will not, we won't resolve this unless we see the situation as it is and unless we see this adopt the model that we're here to work with you we're here to work with you and to look for solutions and i think those those are uh, are key uh, key factors there in terms of the cost and yes we know uh, a lot of uh, what we may come up with uh, may cost money a lot of the, the interventions that, that have been uh, put in place now are costing money what i think we need here is to prove well this approach may work in this context, that approach may work in a different context, but all of it helps to intervene at some point in a child's uh, time through school. And that, that, and I won't call it early intervention because that, that's got a specific connotation, but intervening during those years, the benefit that that brings in terms of the public person, the benefits to society, when you are doing that instead of responding to problems when they've escalated, when when these young people have become adults, and then the the the, the real problems start and the real uh, cost of addressing the issue uh, kicks in. So you know th th there is a a reason and, and a a financial um, reason to intervene earlier than we are at the moment, and I think that that could well be one of the key messages coming out of this piece of work, Chair. Thank, thank you, Robert. That's very insightful as ever. Just for me to add a comment before I ask Councillor Lyndon Jones to come in. Uh, when Kate referred to one pot thinking, I, for me, I think this is really critical. Um, there, there's a feeling that uh, we're in isolation sometimes, that we all work in different silos, but we know in reality we have one pot that we all draw on one way or another. And I've had the feeling in the past that 
sort of hidden costs. So I make a decision which impacts on a sister service. I don't really care now because it's not my problem anymore. So I might squeeze the balloon and create pressure somewhere else, but I'm okay because the problem's alleviated for me today. I've created a problem for someone else tomorrow. So when we think about one pot thinking, uh, we're all in it together. So so I think that there's an important challenge here in the context of governance, overarching processes that we follow. And I think if we think that we can, uh, we've got choices when we have to change in, in our context in public services. One is to sort of find the money somewhere else and increase taxes or look for grants and all that, try to push the budgets up. One is to cut the costs, cut the services, absolutely uh, a dire effect often when we go down that route. And the third route is in this governance, uh, imaginative and innovative context. So for me, I know I've said a number of times about the bonfire of bureaucracy and, and can we stop doing some things and divert our resources into this Swansea standard where we uh, improve by a real collaboration, dynamic partnership. Of course, it depends, as you've said all the way through that, Kate, multi-agency, but it depends on the the collective agreement, the, the sharing of the uh, issues, and dare I say it, pooling of budgets. Uh, is it a lack of money or is it the money's being spent by some partners in a particular way? Uh, and would they be willing to change for common benefit? We'd all improve and benefit with that kind of innovation. Okay, thank you very much, Robert. Uh, Councillor Lyndon Jones. Lyndon? Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Mike. Uh, yeah, can I say, Kate, really insightful, really interesting uh, work that you've done. And I think to get 120 people together, from all those different agencies uh, took some doing. So really well done uh, to get that because you can, when you've got that number of people together, you get, as you said, a real broad representation of different views. And I think that's that's vital. I think uh, you mentioned and uh, uh, about the need for parental and community engagement. What do you see that community engagement looking like? Um, you also mentioned the uh, delivery plan and obviously those actions are important because they uh, it's always good I always like to see actions what what are we going to do to make it different and obviously while resources will be limited we need obviously to look for amongst those actions things that can be done easily really and I think where well, we can get some quick fixes for some of these things which will help uh, overall uh, but uh, those those were some of my sort of observations, and I think you do need to think outside the box sometimes when you're looking at at these sort of solutions. And a part of this, the, the reason a lot of this this is happening is probably the hidden cost of COVID, because when children were away from school for such a long time, and therefore lacked that sort of direction. And I think that is probably part, I don't know if you think this may be part of the problem. OK, thank you, though. Thanks, Lyndon. Kid? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. So um, the bit about community engagement and parental engagement, I think, is really critical because that came out in almost every area um, of the questions that we talked about. And it comes out throughout all of the feedback. I think one of the first things we need to do um, is it, when I talked about that shared vision, is really establish what that engagement needs to look like. So um, I think there's that that again, you know, you write about the breadth of viewpoints. So there's and and you get those very extremes, and it says so one view that because a child is in school, then the school are the experts, so therefore that there should be agreement. Uh, that's one view, and the the very far end view, and I think linked to your point about COVID, is that parents have now had experience of teaching their children at home have been very much kind of you know engaged in that on a daily basis and so that gap between home and school has really kind of grown and almost has become a bit more of a divide and a bit more of a, a, a challenging um you know I mean that in a gentle way culture in terms of more questioning perhaps more seeking understanding um that can sometimes be perceived as, as being quite difficult to manage so I think it's really about establishing what everyone's expectations are on each other so what do schools expect 
from parents? What do parents expect from schools? What's reasonable then um, on both parties' perspective? And how do we bring that that shared understanding together so that, that families can work as part of a collaborative approach with schools? So, so that's kind of, you know, my instinct from the feedback that we're seeing so far. But I think as well, the other thing I'd really want to emphasise is that um, what I've been very careful not to do is to make assumptions and to put my um, kind of own viewpoints onto the feedback. I think we've made a commitment to kind of construct this um, with schools and with partners. Um, and I think we have to test the thinking with them as well. So what the workshops will be doing is around looking at here's here's the feedback, here's what you what you said. How do we do it then? What what next? You know, so so I'm cautious kind of about giving anything too definitive in terms of what I think is the right approach because yeah. I'm I'm one of as you say 120 voices. Thank you, Kate. Robert, and, and I think that's crucial about the success of, of of any model that we work with a professional, as I said earlier, and that also that we don't judge use as an opportunity to judge practice. This is about and recognising that different approaches work in different contexts and that certain approaches that may be very well, may be good practice in certain contexts might be counterproductive in others. And it's about not being judgmental on the profession, but working with them. Thank you, Robert. I think there's a, a level of humility coming from this as a feeling of we are all in it together. We want to step with, not have an impression of having power over telling people, but stepping with other people and listening carefully. Uh, and um, I think in the context of community and parental links, and we said it a number of times in these meetings over the years, it takes a village to raise a child. But is this an opportunity for us to um, consider the potential role and I'm not overburdening counsellors I know how hard counsellors work and I think the vast majority of us have got uh, roles on governing bodies uh, and more than one with more than one school very often and that can be incredibly time consuming but there's an opportunity here to to really tap into that um, elected member network to see and to look for influence and look for links that they might see at a grassroots level that individual agencies might not be aware of. Kate, what do you think? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, I think, you know, we're we're interested in gathering as much information and feedback as possible. And if, you know, um, uh, councillors are happy to, to do that, willing to be engaged, absolutely. And, you know, be happy to support in terms of um, the questions that we're asking and how we're collating the feedback. So simply we get that consistency, really. I think that would be helpful that we find out the information on the things that we're just asking about. But, yeah, certainly be very grateful. Thanks, Kate. The other note that I wrote down here was about it's very difficult to try to get all the partners on the same page. I'm not going to say herding cats, but maybe in that direction. It, it, sensitivities, uh, absolutely. Non judgmental, absolutely. We're adding value for everyone here. Um, is, could this be achieved, do you think, by looking at the, the all the multi agency partners through the Public Service Board? That through that kind of a cascade sort of effect, would that be relevant? I'm thinking of the strategic links and how we get the top married to the bottom and we get the people with their hands on the purse strings to support this innovation from their overarching strategic perspective, married to the grassroots face work where the magic happens. That's the balance I'm thinking of there. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, certainly the Public Service Board representatives have attended the uh, people who are from the subgroups not the overarching strategy so i would hope that we would be getting that kind of mix of, of viewpoints but but it's how where that goes strategically i think i'm not sure that, that would be my decision to make but but i would certainly say that it would be a good thing potentially i, I, I think mike we need to do both because um you know we, we need that strategic direction but we also need to capture what's happening at operational level, to get the input of the people dealing at the chalk face, dealing with these, with these issues day in, day out, week in, week out. Um, you know, let's get that operational model clear in our own minds and let's 
see, well, we need this agency speaking to that agency. We need these links. We need these people working together. Um, th those, are, those are the kind of things I think we need to uh, be clear about because what we don't want is for this to be some kind of top-down uh, imposition that, to be honest with you, as, as with all good intentions, there have been other um, initiatives that have been imposed top-down and because they haven't had been rooted in actual practice on the ground, they haven't fulfilled their potential. And I think that's that's a lesson we need to learn from, um, you know, decades of experience of, of, of the public sector over the years. And that's no criticism of anyone when I say that. It's just a reflection on, you know, you know how things have worked in the past. I absolutely wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, but I think it's very important at the same time to make sure the person with the their hands on the purse strings realise what a positive investment this new way of uh, working would be. Um, when we come to understanding the challenges, when I attended one of the meetings, and, and Sandra and I came along, and uh, very, really very, very good. Uh, and um, one of the things that uh, occurred to me was this idea of behaviour change over time. So uh, to get at, as we go forward from now, to get at areas in which we think the behaviour has deteriorated. Uh, and and that, was, that fascinated me because my early memories of school, I don't want to mention too many of them here, but there really were some extreme behaviours. And I wouldn't mention them in this forum, but I mean extreme behaviours. And the, the teachers and the community seem to be very robust in stepping together to deal with those issues. Um, so I wonder whether there's lessons from the past that we could apply in the current context um, because we, we certainly had resilience in the system and I wonder whether the, 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 that we've lost some of those critical factors over time and maybe COVID has affected not just the children and young people we often look about but the huge pressures this put on parents and carers and on the, the practitioners in schools and other agencies. The, so we've been all incredibly rattled by that experience. So, so I, I wonder whether um, you know, there, there's something to unpick there as well. The last note from me was was uh, in relation to health questions, and we'd heard previously in other meetings about uh, health challenges, increasing no neurodiversity with children, uh, and that sort of stuff, and unpicking some of those issues so we really understand where the child stands. I remember uh, Child and Family Social Services a long time ago doing a lot of work in the context of separation and loss. If you come from a very chaotic, disruptive uh, background, the door's kicked in in the middle of the night and dad's gone to prison again. Uh, we expect the child to turn up bright and bubbly tomorrow. And when she doesn't, we exclude her for the day. So, you know, those those that empathy in the system would be another question mark to go forward. And I saw some of those links when I was in the meeting it, it, previously, you know. So I'm going to put my glasses on to see if you've got other people indicating. I'm looking in the room. Councillor Sandra Joy. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to ask, Kate, um, you put up that slide of next steps and obviously the bottom one was delivery plan. Have you got a time scale to when you will either pull a delivery plan together or it will start to be even trialled before implemented? Yeah, sure. So um, it's a, it's, we've got to strike a balance between making sure the work is done to the sufficient kind of, you know, quality and rigour um, and also mindful that there's, you know, real urgency um, in terms of a need for a strategy and a plan. So the aim um, is to have a draft strategy in place by uh, January. Um, and then we, the delivery plan would be would be part and parcel of that, really. So that draft we would hope would be in place by then, with a view to start delivering really from um, um, March, April onwards. That's that's the aim. Thank you. I so get that because, as you say, is is you can't pull it together until you've really you've got to trial it first and see see what's working and what isn't. But that's balanced against the fact there is an urgent need for some cohesion here isn't there yeah <laughs> thank you sandra the, the time is tight isn't it i mean looking back to the series of committee meetings so far this year we've covered an awful lot of ground really quite quickly and that's impressive isn't it i can't see anybody else indicating on you can i thank you as advocate for for your uh, excellent report 
you have pulled this together really very quickly and as Lyndon said quite rightly engage with so many people from so many different agencies in a very meaningful way um so i can't see anyone else indicating no one in the room we are looking content there's even smiles on some people's faces which is always a good thing so uh, i'm going to move on now to the next agenda item i think we're looking at the work plan um for the rest of the year and we've got the uh, next meeting on the 4th of the December, where we go back to Di Thomas and learn a progress. And then we've got uh, supporting positive behaviour in January, the 15th of January. And then back to learn a progress on the 19th of February. And then final reports to come together on the 9th of April. So those are the consistent dates for your diary. None of them have changed. And on that point, no one's indicating. We are still smiling. And I can with some confidence, draw the meeting to a close. Thank you all very much, everyone.